I think a really important thing is how we learn. We know from research colleagues in Finland that it's the way in which students engage with their learning actually has a huge bearing on, on their well-being as well. And when students feel that, for example, if I ask a student, what, what's your goal from university? What do you want to get out of this? And they go first. I know that we're going to have some problems. So we need to look at, okay, why did you choose this subject? Why do you want, what's your meaning? If you, if you get into what is their why, what gives them meaning and purpose, that opens up a, a huge amount. Hello, and welcome to another in our Human Givens podcast series. I'm Julia Wellstead, and today I'll be discussing how anxiety affects student learning with Joanna Baker. Joanna is a human givens therapist running her own practice and she's also the psychoeducation coordinator at the University of Derby. And there she also delivers workshops on various aspects of well-being. Hi Joanna. Hi Jules. Hi, thanks so much for joining us today. As I've just said, you work at the, the university, so you must see the effects that anxiety and stress can have on students. So perhaps can we begin with an overview of why that state of anxiety impacts upon our ability to learn? What's the link there? Absolutely. Well, I mean, to start off, we all experience anxiety at some point. It's just a natural response to the threat of danger. And that response can, um, can be life-saving in, in some circumstances. But I think what we see at the moment, like terms like depression, stress, the word anxiety is, is being used more and more these days to describe a whole range of experiences. So, you know, perhaps rather than saying that you're worried about something, people might describe their experience as anxiety without actually really knowing or understanding what that, that means. And I think that can really underplay how debilitating anxiety can, can really be and therefore the risks associated with it as well. So whilst, you know, anxiety, I think really is almost always um, ongoing negative thoughts about the future. It's, it's a misuse of our imagination, if you like. Rehearsing things going wrong. So students thinking about the, the worst possible case scenario of, you know, of, of failing, um, really. Fear of failure is, is a big part of that. You know, uh, constantly conjuring up negative outcomes. Um, and unfortunately, the brain doesn't really know the difference very well um, between the imagination and the reality. So although these scenarios that they can be, can be thinking of are, are imaginary, the distress that it causes is, is very real. So this emotional thinking style causes all sorts of physiological symptoms that many people be familiar with. Shortness of breath, racing heart, um, you know, the knots in the stomach, clammy palms, etc. Um, but what people might not know is actually it can affect our other senses um, as well. For me, I know when I felt very anxious in the past, my hearing goes a bit muffled um, and uh, everything sounds as if I'm a little bit under water. It has been pointed out, I have really big hair. It has been pointed out, it actually might be my hair over my ear. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe that. No, I'm, I'm, I'm more on the muffled hearing thing. Yep. Yeah. Um, I know that um, my colleague, Gareth Hughes, had a, had a student who had been struggling with, with their sight and they've been to the opticians and um, thinking that they, they needed glasses. And, and actually, um, when, when the anxiety was, was relieved, um, the vision became better. So if you think about what's happening here in, in the fight, flight, freeze mechanism, the, the, it's preparing our body to respond. Um, and by altering our senses, it helps us to focus on the danger, the, the present danger to the exclusion of other things. So it's no surprise really that our, our senses can potentially be altered um, as well in high levels. Absolutely. I completely get that. I, I, you can almost feel that sort of slight feeling of tunnel vision sometimes when you're very stressed which is that sort of zoning in on what, what it is, yes. On what it is. So if we look at the human givens APEP model, it, it, it explains that there, there, there might be an activating agent or trigger in the environment that starts a problem. So perhaps there's an exam coming up for a student or maybe they have to give a presentation or a performance. And, and that's that activating agent in the environment. That's the A for APEP. The P stands then for, for the pattern match. So that can be both um, a, an instinctive pattern match or something through learned experience and that could be a, a past unpleasant experience around you know GCSEs maybe or when they had to, to say something in class uh, or also through um, the narrative expectation that runs through our society is that um, exams are scary I mean actually giving a presentation if you if you think that you're standing up you're one person speaking to to a pack of 
people and you're outside that pack, it's no wonder then that we, we do find those situations threatening um, to, yeah. to, to varying degrees. So the E then stands for how that elicits the emotional response in the individual, which can then in turn sometimes link to uh, emotionally charged thinking or black and white thinking. So, that, so that's the T there. So the higher the emotional arousal levels, the higher the level of black and white thinking somebody is going to, to be experiencing. Actually, the, the first three bits of those happen outside of your conscious awareness. Yes, and I was just thinking there, as you said that, obviously sometimes it results in a thought, yeah. but sometimes the whole thing is subconscious and we have an emotional response without even quite understanding why. Totally. Um, and th that, that can then feed into the black and white thinking, which then feeds back into that emotion. It's a cycle. Um, and, and all of that, you know, is, is not conducive to learning. Of course not, because your, your brain's taken up doing all these other things rather than actually being open to learning. Is that how you would put it to somebody? Absolutely. You know, if you think that the, the emotional centre of the brain is housed in, in the limbic system, that developed millions of years before the neocortex, the, the thinking, planning part of our brain. And there's an immeasurable amount of connections going on there between the two. So it makes sense that emotion influences how we think and feel. The work of Joseph Ledoux um, really showed us that emotion comes before our thought. But also, as I said, you know, it's when that, that elaborate thought process is then feed back in to, to, to charge that emotion more. And I quite often use that analogy when I'm, I'm talking to students that his snake stick analogy, if you were walking through the wood and you saw something that could be a stick or it could be a snake, if you hung around long enough to find out whether it was a snake or whether you might get bitten and if you got bitten is it poisonous is it going to kill you by that point you might already be dead so so your instinct kicks in and, and you jump back out of the way now if it's a stick you feel a bit silly but if it's a snake that could just have saved your life but why does that happen why do we have that instinctive response and obviously in in a you know a situation like that or on a, a weekend away with bed grills that's an appropriate response <laughs> In the exam room or giving a presentation, that's what we'd call an emotional hijack. But why is that happening? So another way I used to, to explain it is talking about the brain uh, literally is your, your head office. So you've got your, your amygdala um, and that's your brain security officer, which is scanning the environment for any threat. And when it detects a threat, it has a quick word with the, the secretary, the, uh, the cingulate gyrus, and to see where, whether or not we've got any files, what do we know about this situation? So message then goes down to the hippocampus. Do we know, what do we know about this? And, and to the degree that it perceives that there's a threat, it sets off a load of inhibitory neurotransmitters, which cuts off access to the cortex, the, the thinking, or limits access to our cortex, our thinking part of our brain, which we can refer to as the boss. Very, very clever, but at a, at a slower working pace um, than, than the, uh, the limbic system. Right, so it shuts it down because it's too slow. Yeah. In, a, in a situation that might be a survival or a survive or die situation. We just need to act, yeah, we don't need to have a board meeting about it. We just need to, to act on this, uh, on this, this threatening um, situation. So, you know, as I said, if it's a snake, that behaviour is just, just save your life. However, if the, uh, the singular gyrus is deeming that it's important enough that we are going to have to consult with uh, the boss of cortex, what it does is it sends a signal up there, sprinkling on a whole load of uh, the dopamine on those memories, showing the boss how, much, how important this situation was before. And that's when we get that elaborate, elaborated um, thinking style uh, from, from the cortex, that catastrophic um, but narrowed black and white thinking. So the in some instances, the, the cortex does get involved and that's when we see, see the, uh, the catastrophic thinking styles. Right, that's beautifully described. Thank you so much, Joe. So getting back to students, what types of anxiety do they face? Well, I mean, they might have difficulty concentrating, understanding or understanding the information that, that they need to take in if they're feeling anxious. And even if they are taking it in, that might just be bouncing around in the brain, not being able to be processed properly or stored in in long-term memory. Things that uh, I see regularly with students is um, exam anxiety. We, we have a high presentation of exam anxiety. We know about 25 to 30% of our students experience that. 
presentation anxiety, performance anxiety. We have some performing arts degrees um, and some, some technical music degrees at our university. So we know that they sometimes suffer with performance anxiety. Transition anxiety as well. Students coming into university into a, an unfamiliar surrounding. For some students, that, that can cause a degree of anxiety as well. Transition into the next year, you know, from stage one to two or two to three, that can give rise to anxiety as they move on to, to a higher level. And actually also transition out of university, of, of leaving and going out into the big wide world um, as well, we see a, a degree of anxiety. Yes. Um, yes, of course, that's one I hadn't thought of, but uh, that's a very big one, isn't it? Yes. Um, in the university, I hadn't thought about it either. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yes. And another interesting one, um, and a distinct one, is maths anxiety. And that's being talked about more and more now. There's a... Um, we have a couple of professors at our university who have done a fair amount of research on that as well. Um, and, and a very specific thing that we know we can trace back right to, to very early years of maths. Yes, I have heard that on the news as well. Is the thinking there that that's because, as you said with exams, we're, we're almost taught to be scared of maths? I think without wanting to, to demonise our education system, I think things uh, are, on that respect have got a lot worse the advent of SATs. I know personally when my children, um, when my, my eldest is just about to be 14, when she was doing her SATs, her primary school actually stopped teaching anything to that year apart from maths and English. Um, they stopped PE, they stopped any sciences or arts, and it was very much focused for the year on, on maths and English. And I, as you can imagine, kicked back on this and told my daughter that I really didn't give a monkey's what she got in their SATs. And it wasn't testing her, it was testing the school. Certainly for somebody who works in the university, nobody was ever going to ask her in her life what she got in her SATs. And I did actually go in and talk to the school and say, explain to them why what they were doing was, was having the reverse effect. And if anything, they should be doing P every day. You know, they should be upping the exercise. Um, Absolutely, yes. Improving it. And, and for the subsequent year, for my younger daughter, when she did it, they did. They did this uh, wake up and shake up every day. And they went into overkill a little bit. They had mindfulness sessions and stuff, which was all great. But um, I think they, they did learn from their, their mistakes and they did change. But that's not an isolated case. I think that's happening across the board, right, from when they do their first SATs. Um, and, and certainly through the, the year six that. So students are being taught, or pupils in this case, are being taught that it's almost a life or death situation. And also the stress that it causes to the teachers as well, which, you know, is inevitably going to rub off on, on the pupils. Everybody's in this high state of anxiety around these little tests. And, th and that builds as, as you go through to, to your GCSEs and to A-levels. It's about the grade. It's about getting through that exam it's not about the learning. It's becoming further and further away from actually learning and more about what grade you get. Yes, and of course that, as you say, the teachers are equally stressed and anxious because their school is being graded in effect as well. A huge amount of pressure on teachers to get these, to get these, um, these results, um, which is obviously why they've gone down that route. But I think what you end up with I know when I did my A-levels, I did English as one of them. And, and when I did English, I had to go and I had to go read all the books. I had to find references for myself, quotations that I could use when I was um, writing my essays in my A-levels. And on the most, that's not happening anymore. What we're seeing instead is that students are actually being given quotes that they need to learn for their A-levels that they can churn out. So we're de-skilling them. We're, they're, they're not able to, to have these skills to go out and, and learn these things for themselves. We're feeding them to get the grade rather than helping them to learn. And of course, yes, they're not learning how to learn. And then, of course, they come to university and suddenly they do have to be able to look up and read for themselves and work all these things out for themselves, don't they? Yeah. So um, for a lot of them, uh, that, that can be hugely anxious uh, time for them. But, you know, for, for others, it's hugely liberating. Um, and actually, certainly for our, our students that we see that have um, SPLD specific learning differences, such as uh, dyslexia, dyscalculia, a huge amount of anxiety uh, associated with, with those um, learning differences. And actually, we know that the anxiety is a bigger problem than the learning difference in the first place in many, many cases. So when they come into an environment where we, we actually run something called forward thinking. So it's a two day event for, for students with, with specific learning differences. And we explain to them how the brain's working and actually 
why they probably get to the answer before everybody else, but maybe they miss out some of the bits in, uh, in the middle as to how they got there. It's reassuring to them that they know that they're in this conceptual learning environment now and somewhere that they can actually thrive. They're, they're not working in a linear way anymore as they were at school. We've ascertained that there's a lot of anxiety and stress. Now, if that's not dealt with, what can it lead on to? Um, you know, over, over time, uh, the long-term effects of, of high levels of anxiety on the body are going to lead to, you know, perhaps actually becoming physically poorly as, as well as mentally poorly. But certainly anxiety and depression, the two are used quite interchangeably and often go quite hand in hand. So high levels of emotional arousal over time are going to lead to, to depressive state um, more often than not. So that's why you, we quite often see, a, when we see a diagnosis of generalised anxiety disorder, it's quite often got a diagnosis of depression alongside it as well. What else can it lead to? Um, at extremes, we can uh, see instances of psychosis, we can see self-harming behaviour, and in some cases, suicidal ideation as well. And of course, people just dropping out of further or higher education, presumably, which yeah, is a great shame. A huge shame. And uh, we, we actually start off the year for the majority of our, our new starters with a talk from my psychoeducation team called Getting the Most Out of the University. And within that, we explain that the reason students trip up is not because they don't have the academic ability. We know that all the evidence points to that. Um, the reason students may drop out is because they lack the coping skills not because they like the academic ability. We know they've got the academic ability because otherwise we wouldn't have accepted them. What they need to be looking at is treating their time at university as learning holistically, not just their subject, but also developing themselves. Now, Joe, you've mentioned a couple of things that you do for the students. One was forward thinking, and you've just mentioned getting the most out of uni. What else do you, and I think you've got a whole wellbeing team there at Derby, what, what else do you offer that can help? So within student wellbeing, we have many, many arms to that. We have um, our psychological wellbeing team, which is our team of therapists who offer one-to-one -one sessions. So within that, students can have up to six sessions, but more often than not only need three or four to make long-lasting, significant improvements um, in their lives. Is that only if someone comes to you asking for sessions, or do you sort of pinpoint someone who might need them and suggest it how does that sort of come together it may be that an academic sees that a student's struggling and they say you know have you thought about going and speaking to well-being nobody gets sent to us um you know <laughs> they need to actually want to want to come along so certainly academics and um all, all staff actually um which i'll come on to talk about a bit later on uh, uh, know how to signpost to us also, if there's something specific like presentation anxiety or exam anxiety um, that, that's a problem, we have something very separate from therapy um, that is done by um, a few members of, of the therapy team, a discrete package, if you like, of three sessions that are bespoke to performance anxiety or presentation anxiety or exam anxiety. Um, so that's, that's done outside therapy. And I think sometimes uh, if students feel that they need to go and see a therapist for that, they, they can be a little bit put off. But actually having something like that that's very practical is a very good way of, of working with them. Yes, that's really nice. Yes. And, and do you, are your doors open to indeed tutors or other people in, within the university environment? No, we only work with, with students very specifically because we don't want there to be any conflict of, of interest. So, um, but we do have a separate well-being, staff well-being team that deal with that side of things. Yeah. I seem to remember, I went to Gareth Hughes' one day training session, which we'll talk about a bit later, actually. But I seem to remember really nice touches, as I thought, with my sons going through uni at the time, like having bottles of water at the exam entrances with the 7-Eleven um, breathing technique printed on the side things like that are you still doing that sort of thing we do we have water bottles we have stress balls um we have quite a good bibliography as well we have quite a lot of leaflets around certainly it's very much geared towards empowering our students to to help themselves 
And within that, uh, alongside the, the one-to-one sessions that we offer, we have the psychoeducation team as well, which is, is the team that I coordinate. And we go out across the university delivering really carefully designed um, workshops and talks. And we'll deliver to all year groups, all programmes across all campuses throughout the year, things like um, wellbeing and academic achievement, managing stress, improving presentation performance, improving exam performance. We do one on team dynamics. Um, and also more recently, um, a colleague has written one on digital wellbeing, which is really popular. Mm-hmm. So we, we deliver these on programme, which means that um, they're, they're mandatory attendance. Uh, we don't do drop-in sessions. What we know is that if, if a student sees it as part of their course, they see the relevance to them and they appreciate that. If it's something that they can take or leave, they won't see its significance. And it, it's important to us that, you know, as I, as I said, that we're in, empowering students to take charge, really, take responsibility for their own well-being and, and that they see their time at university as developing as a whole human yes I think that's excellent the fact that it's mandatory that really rings a bell with me because otherwise there would be the chance to think oh that's not for me or I don't need that and completely miss a heap of excellent information and learning absolutely and I think you know it a student may not recognize we're not always great at recognizing things in ourselves so I've experienced before going along to a, a particular cohort oh this is Joe from from student well-being and you see some eyes rolling um, and you think oh this is going to be fun um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and then you start talking to them and you give them you know I, I'll have a, a diagram of the brain up and I'll explain to them what's what's happening and I'll, you know I'll explain the link between their well-being and their learning and and why people who um, engage in deep learning have a better a greater sense of well-being than those who just surface learning and are looking for grades and and why that pushes up anxiety and you can see them start to go ching 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 and then they really appreciate why it's relevant and why it matters what we're trying to do more and more now within my team is work we always tailor it to the cohort so there's no point going out and doing well-being academic achievement to performing arts and then going and doing exactly the same thing to engineering or to business it just wouldn't work so we do tailor it very much to the cohort so we make sure that we're using their language that we're speaking to where they where they sit to where they live yes and using their metaphors if you like yes absolutely using their metaphors is hugely important otherwise they're they're just not going to get what what you're talking about so so we do that anyway, but what we're doing more and more now is working alongside academics to actually embed in curriculum. And this is a really exciting time so that it's actually becoming part of modules. We, I sit down and talk to them, Gareth and I quite often go along together. And so what, what is it that you need? Where are your trigger points? What are you struggling with? And how can we tailor something? How can we write something that will work in, in this module for you? Um, so we're doing more and more of that stuff which is fantastic. Oh, that's excellent. So that's really what teachers and lecturers can do is get involved with getting that into their curriculum. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. And I think what's, what's really helped is the beginning of 2018, there was a piece of research published by Gareth and in conjunction with Student Minds and King's College London. And that looked at the role of, of the academic um, in terms of student mental health. And what it found was that, unsurprisingly, academics are the front line. They're the first port of call if a student is in distress because the student is going to go where they've got an established relationship and that more often than not, that will be their personal academic tutor. But they don't feel well equipped to deal with that. Um, You know, that's not not what they're trained to do. And with the increase of people disclosing mental health difficulties, they were really feeling overwhelmed. So in response to that piece of research, we devised a, a training program for the whole university. We take very much a whole university approach to mental health. And that training program rolls out to all staff from people on the ground, our cleaners, our estate staff, security, through to careers, library, halls. I'm going to miss somebody out. I know I am. Everybody. <laughs> right the way up through to executives and vice chancellor. They will all receive role specific and that's important because there's lots of fantastic generic training out there but what we know about the situation nature of learning is that they need to be able to take something away and put it into place in their role and and run with it so so that's what we've done we've we've designed this this program 
and certainly working with the personal academic tutors on their role with student mental health, looking at their boundaries, um, because that can get a bit blurred. You know, what are the limitations of their role? So looking at their boundaries and um, the legalities of what they're doing, of, of where those boundaries lie, encouraging them to signpost and how to signpost and when to signpost more importantly as well. And actually sort of taking that pressure off. And I know since, since we've been doing that, um, we've seen an increase um, in, in footfall in, uh, in student wellbeing. We know that academics are feeling really reassured that they can just pick up the phone and, and have a conversation with us. It can be a hypothetical conversation, but it can get to a point where we say, this can't be hypothetical anymore. Um, we, we need to intervene. So they've got that, that open to them and they know and they've got that information. The other thing that we, we have said that is really important is actually modeling behavior. So if they're sending an email at two or three o'clock in the morning um, and the student can see that they've sent that, that's not sending out the message that, that we want really about looking after their own being. And also then being congruent about that. Not, you know, actually, if you turn up looking disheveled and stressed and, and a bit ratty, how's that going to make your student feel? You know, what message is that sending out? So really encouraging them to be mindful of their own well-being. So although we don't do therapy for our academics, we do take responsibility for the training of them in terms of student mental health. And that in turn um, impacts on, on their own mental health. And we've had some fantastic feedback from that as well. We talk an awful lot about sleep um, in, in what we do. I'll come on to that a little bit later on. But yes. that's been absolutely excellent. That has encouraged to, uh, our academics then to engage with the psychoeducation team more because they can see that we go out and we're actually talking sense. We're, we're, we're coming from a very scientifically sound evidence-based model and they're like this is actually great we need some of this um on on our program i uh, love that yes so, and, and so certainly as uh, i can remember quite a lot of disheveled and grumpy lecturers in my <laughs> university days so i'm i'm loving what you're saying if they do i mean they're they're always everybody's different they're always going to be people who feel like they want to do a little bit more and when you've you've got somebody who feels like that um, what we've given them is we've, we've, we've done a load of psychoeducation with them ourselves anyway. So what we say is, look, you know, if you feel that you want to, to help a little bit, perhaps ask them, you know, are you sleeping OK? What's your diet like? You know, when did you last have a, a good meal? And, you know, do you drink enough water? Do you get exercise? So looking at those very simple things that are, are completely outside the therapeutic relationship. Or, or can be you know and are safe territory so so sticking with that and that can also be a really useful way for the men to feed into signposting to well-being if necessary how can parents or guardians help to reduce student anxiety well <laughs> <laughs> i think teaching your children life skills um is is a, is a place to start encouraging them to problem solve in the real world a very wise man, uh, a human givens therapist, Johnny Leach, who suddenly passed away in 2012, once recited a motto to me. And he said, prepare your child for the road, not the road for your child. And I think what we see these days is um, a lot of so-called helicopter parenting and uh, more recently snowplow or bulldozer parenting, where the helicopter parenting, I guess, is where p parents are constantly hovering around and, and not letting their children actually do things for themselves. And the, the, the bulldozer or, or, or snowplow parenting is where they're actually just clearing away any obstacle in the path of their child so that they have this smooth, uh, this smooth ride. I know Gareth and I were talking the other day and he'd read something about somebody saying that the way that they believed their child's happiness was to create this perfect childhood. And we were saying, but what does that look like? And how, how horrendous and how much pressure and how unrealistic a view of the real world that really is. So when you clear away all the obstacles in their path and go out to create this perfect childhood, you don't allow them to build the life coping skills that they're going to need down the road. You're then really putting pressure on them to be successful and be happy and all those sorts yes, of things. Because it can't be anything less than perfect. When they learn healthy ways to cope with distress and disappointments, adversity, fallouts, whatever, they experience the joy and the pride um, and the fulfillment that actually being stretched and achieving brings. And without that, um, they won't have that resilience, that buzzword, that quite unhelpful buzzword, quite frankly, that everybody's talking about. Sometimes I'll get an email saying, oh, can you come along and do something to make my students more resilient? I'm, <laughs> not in an hour, really, no, but... 
you know, and as harsh as it sounds, it's actually our jobs as, as parents to help our children to not need us. Whilst nobody's going to argue that at the end of the day, love is the most important thing we can give our child. True love actually goes beyond that short term happiness, that instant gratification of no problems at all. And actually goes in looking towards long term happiness and, and fulfillment. And, and what do our children need to get there? And yeah. what they need is to have coping skills to be able to deal with these things themselves. Absolutely. And that our final question here is how can students help themselves? Um, when a student understands the link between their own well-being and their studies, it makes a huge difference. And, and education really should be about empowering students. And, and there's no greater sense of that than being able to understand how their mind works and to feel a sense of control and ownership over the decisions that they're making. So we really want students to be able to take control of their own well-being, ensuring that they're, they're sleeping well, eating well, taking regular exercise, etc., socialising. And when they find their studies tough, which they are going to, because it's not meant to be easy. And I think this is the thing, you know the difference between stretch and stress you know we, we need stretch in our life it's what gives us meaning and purpose and it's the narrative that, that we give that are we feeling stressed or are we feeling stretched and yes. whereabouts are we on that on that spectrum and being able to see where we are and, and to moderate that and that's what we very much do in our uh, in our managing stress workshop that we deliver is looking at that and, and what is stretch and what is stress and whereabouts are you and what are your triggers? What tells you you're tipping over into stress? And that's the point you need to step back and assess, you know, are you meeting your physical needs and are you meeting your, how well are your emotional needs being met in balance? And, and that very much um, looks at that. I've also come across uh, as a therapist, people who are almost going beyond stretch and stress to trying to achieve perfectionism. And there's an element of what I'd call comparanoia in there where they're looking at everybody else and, and comparing themselves. And that aim for perfectionism, I think, is very destructive, isn't it? It's incredibly destructive. And we see it manifest in so many different ways. The stuff that people put on social media, and that's a whole other conversation for us to have, but people see the perfect version um, or, or this hashtag living my perfect life or living my best life. And if you're feeling particularly stressed or anxious or maybe a little bit homesick and you're sitting looking at all of this stuff online, that can paranoia comes in and it's like, well, my life's terrible compared to that. And these people seem to find this so easy. And that's one of the, you know, in terms of academic work, and that's one of the things I say to them, actually have conversations with your cohorts because they are probably finding this as difficult as you but perhaps nobody wants to say they're finding it difficult we, we find that there are pockets of people and, and perhaps they gravitate towards the ones that are, are not feeling so great or and, and they keep away from the ones who are seemingly doing great but actually they're probably finding it quite a challenge um, as well so without fail in all of our therapy sessions and within every single um, workshop that I, I deliver I will teach 7-Eleven breathing and when we have uh, feedback from students, what did you enjoy most about the session? 7-Eleven breathing comes out top every time, closely followed by, in inverted commas, the brain stuff. They love it. They love the information. They love how that makes them feel, that they've got a basic understanding now of what's going on. And the 7-Eleven breathing is something immediate that can, they can take away with them and they can do it anytime. And I always say, look, if you forget it, you can Google it absolutely fine or you can come along and you can say look can somebody just run through this again with me it's not a problem i will just say at this point anyone listening if you want to look up 7-eleven breathing it's very easy to find uh, you can find it on our human given site or as you say just by googling yeah um i talk to them very much about breaking down things down into chunks if you've got an assignment that's due and it's five thousand words blimey that seems a bit overwhelming doesn't it so can we break it down um, how long do you need to do this piece of work, do you think? Okay, so how much is that per week? How much is that per day? Okay, so maybe you can look at doing 250, 500 words a day. 250 words, it's, it's nothing, is it? It's a, it's a handwritten side of A4. So when you break it down like that, it's not suddenly this huge, big, overwhelming monster. And alongside that, I really talk about factoring in breaks as well. So rather than just sitting for a day and plugging away at it, um, if you break it down into, say, 90 minute chunks or even an hour, you know, work for an hour, take a 30 minute break, work for an hour, take a 30 minute break. You're going to be so much more productive when you come to sit back down and, and work um, than, than if you just plug away at it all day. Once you've calmed down about a 5,000 word essay, for instance, 
you've then got the capacity and done the breaking down, as you say, you've then got the capacity to do the background reading or the extra little bits that make it a better essay. Completely. And I think that's, that's the key. And that's where maybe um, other, other therapies or, or other approaches don't, don't factor that bit in. You need to lower that emotional arousal level. If the person's still in a high state of emotional arousal, you can't get into that cortex. You can't get into that rational brain. So, so the key really is to, to lower the emotional arousal levels before you start to do the work. And whether that's in therapy or whether that's teaching them to do 7-11 breathing so that they can prepare themselves. I quite often talk about, you know, warming up like an athlete would warm up for a race. You know, you need to warm up to do the work. And maybe part of that is, is sitting and taking some time and um, regulating your breathing before you start. I think a really important thing is how we learn. We know from research colleagues in Finland that it's the way in which students engage with their learning actually has a huge bearing on, on their well-being as well. And when students feel that, for example, if I ask a student, what, what's your goal from university? What do you want to get out of this? And they go first. I know that we're mm. going to have some problems. So we need to look at, okay, why did you choose this subject? Why do you want, what's your meaning? If you, if you get into what is their why, what gives them meaning and purpose, that opens up a, a huge amount. And if, if we can look at reading around the subject and engaging in deep learning where they're not just skimming the surface of, and learning what they need to know to get them through the exam, they're actually making greater connections in their brain and they're intrinsically interested in, in what they're doing. And, and that motivation comes from an intrinsic place rather than an extrinsic place. Those students are going to have a much higher level of, of well-being than the student who is surface learning, skimming through to get the grade, to, to move on to the next level, jump, jump, jump. And actually, uh, what we see in, in those situations is, is burnout. Um, so that's why it's important to, to help the students to understand that, that, that that's better for their well-being and actually the end result for their, their overall academic achievement as well long term. Now, Joe, I actually have one question. This is University of Derby. Are, are other universities offering the same facility and psychoeducation? I know that there are certain universities that offer psychoeducation workshops, absolutely. Um, and there's some fantastic work going on in, in a number of universities. I think we're really lucky um, at the University of Derby. Our vice chancellor is, is incredibly supportive of, of the work that we do in terms of psychoeducation and also our psychological well-being and indeed our whole student well-being offer. Some universities may be limited really in what they can offer because of, of budget and funding. Perhaps they're not able to offer maybe as much as, as, as we do, but certainly there are other universities out there that are, are doing similar things. Yeah. yeah, so it just strikes me that as a prospective student or a parent thereof, it's worth looking into that as well as what's on, on offer academically and co different courses and things is to look at the well-being facility, if you like. Absolutely. And I, I wouldn't just necessarily look on league tables. There are a number of different league tables that measure the effectiveness of the well-being service. I think you really need to go and look. You need to talk to people as go well. And talk. Yes. If, if it's something that you, you think that you're going to need, then definitely. But I wouldn't right off ever needing it you know we put on the the provision at derby and at some point everybody's going to need some support of some form at some point you know they're never going to need therapy from us but they might need something from us so you don't know what's going to happen you don't know what's going to come up so it, it, it's always worth checking that out i know so 